with me when I asked about who are some dynamic duos, people like, you know, Batman and Robin. I mean, you can't think of Batman without at least considering Robin, you know? I mean, like Lone Ranger and Tonto, right? Right? You got it. I'm talking about the good old-fashioned black and white, high-ho silver Long Ranger and Tonto, you know? I thought you, you think of one, you think of the other. So I started putting that out there, and some of you had some great ones that you, that you gave me. Some people like Bonnie and Clyde, man. Yeah, absolutely. Got to think of Bonnie and Clyde. And Abbott and Costello. Abbott and Costello. Some of the younger generation are going, I have no idea who that is. Who that is. Abbott and Costello. Who's on first, man? One of the greatest monologues of all time. Oh, this one. Bo and Luke Duke. Oh, yeah. Man, you can't beat General Lee sliding across. Man, I used to always want to try to slide across my hood, you know, and then dive into the window. I'd get stuck, though. I kind of caught a cramp one time, you know, trying to do that, you know. And, and then there was this one. Then there was, uh, okay, all right, Michael Jordan and Scottie Pippen, all right. Maybe a little more, more modern now. I don't know. Do we have any Miami Heat basketball fans in here? All right, maybe a few of you. Maybe like Dwayne Wade, you know, D. Wade and LeBron James. You think one, you think the other. Okay, how about this one? This one was good. Hulk Hogan and Macho Man Randy Savage. Yes. Yeah. You gotta learn to, you know, body slam, suplex, drop the elbow. Oh yeah, you know. I mean, you gotta think of that. Okay, this one. Yeah, you can't forget Sesame Street. Bert and Ernie. Ah uh, yeah. Hey, we had to all had to learn how to read and count somewhere, right? Yeah, uh, Bert and Ernie. Can't think of one without thinking of the other. And this one. Couple ladies, Laverne and Shirley. Laverne and Shirley. Yes, I used to love that show, Laverne and Shirley. Laverne. Oh, and this one. This was one of my favorites because I'm telling you, this is one of the deepest movies that we could ever learn life lessons from. I mean, I'm talking about things like friendship and, and teamwork. How about this? Buzz and Woody. <laughs> Over the top, Buzz and Woody. Toy Story, you learned some valuable lessons from those two guys about friendship and, and teamwork. You start thinking about these kinds of people. You think about the dynamic duels. You think about one, you automatically think about the other one. You think about their relationships. You think about their friendship. You think about the things that they did together. And you think about the things that they accomplished. And whatever it was, you start thinking about these dynamic duos together. Well, when we talk about life in the community, and we're talking about life in this community that we call Coastal Life Church, I think really what I want us to do is to see church as a set of relationships. I don't want us just to see Coastal Life Church as this place I go or as this building that sits at a physical address that I show up to on the weekends, at least most weekends. And I don't want us to see Coastal Life Church just as a, a set of programs that we do. I want us to see Coastal Life Church as just a set of relationships that I'm in. And I, I wanted to see, because see, what happens is too many people just kind of go to church but I want you to learn how to be church. I want us to learn how to be church together. In other words, I want us to learn how to be in meaningful relationships with each other. You see, my desire for us as a Coastal Life Church is that we're a place that people continually come to to check out. In other words, one of the greatest things that God's blessed our church with is that every single weekend, there are new people that come just to check out Coastal Life Church, mainly because you've invited them or you've talked about your church or they've heard about your church. And so they come just to check out. So we have guests all the time. I love I love that every Saturday and every Sunday we have guests all the time just to come and check out. I want people to come here and feel like, hey, I came as a guest. And while I was here as a guest, man, I felt welcome. Man, I felt like people, people really engaged with me. I felt like people really cared that I was there. And so as a guest, they came, but then they kept coming back. So they moved from just being a guest at Coastal Life Church. Well, all of a sudden they came here and they found friends. Maybe it took some time and they found some friends. All of a sudden now Coastal Life Church is a place where I found some friendship. There's some people that I enjoy. There's some people maybe I don't, but there's more people that I do. And, and, and I found friends there and then there's friends there. And so now I look at Coastal Life Church as, as part of where I have some of my friendships then. And this is a great place to be. And I love it when people move from being guests to being all of a sudden this is a place for friends. But I, my desire is that we go even deeper than that. All of a sudden, now Coastal Life Church becomes a place where you find this sense of family. That, that you've moved from guest to place where, hey, I've got friends there and there's friendships there. But now I feel like this is a sense of my family, this spiritual family that I'm in. It's where I'm in deep relationships with people. I'm in, I'm in meaningful relationships with people. This is people I would call my family. That's the desire 
of Pastor Joe and myself to realize that, hey, Coastal Life Church is this place where people are in meaningful relationships with other people. Because you realize this, that God wired every single one of us to be in relationships. He did. God wired us and designed us in our personalities and our wirings and how we work to be in relationships with people. He never intended us to be alone. He never intended us to be the Lone Ranger. Even Lone Ranger had Tonto, you know. I mean, everybody has somebody. And, and for some people, some of your personalities are, yeah, I mean, you, you've got all kinds of friends. You've got crazy amounts of people all around you. Like if we look at your Facebook page, you've got like 1,500 friends. And you feel like they're all your friends. I mean, I know every single one of them, you know. And you, but other people are like, man, my Facebook page has got two people on it, you know. And I'm fine with that. I'm more kind. Because some of us like to have a lot of people, but everybody has somebody. And it may be your personality, your wiring is just to have one or two people that really are kind of close to you that you call friends because that's just how you're designed. But I'm telling you, every single one of us are designed to be in relationships. The same way God desired and designed us in community as Christians to be in relationships and in community. God never designed us as Christians, as followers of his, as, as Christ followers, or as his church to do this journey of Christianity all by ourselves. He never designed you to do. He never designed Christianity to be this thing that a person does all alone and by themselves. He designed it for us to be in community in spiritual relationships with other people. That's why we have places like Coastal Life Church, so you can find spiritual relationships with other people and do this journey that we call Christianity with someone. <laughs> Well, in the Bible, all throughout the scriptures, we see this. We see this truth. We see the principles. We see benefits of, of people being in relationships with each other. We see the benefits and the meaningfulness of, of people being in strong relationships with an individual or a group of people. I remember in my life, I look at my life, and I can look at different seasons of my life and see how God put people in my life and developed some strong relationships in my life. I remember the very first time I really, really really experienced what a sense of spiritual community was, was in college. And I got to be a part of a group of friends that, that we were just hung out together all the time. I mean, we, we went to church together. We, we kind of served in ministry together as volunteers. We, we, we went to Taco Bell together a lot. And we liked that. And we hung out. I even met my wife in that group of friends. And uh, she said yes one day. It was amazing. And, uh, and, and, and it was just incredible that we just did life together. And then one, there was a guy in that that was my best friend. I'm telling you, him and I, Jeremy, he, him and I just, we, we did life together. I mean, Jeremy knew the things in my life. He knew the junk in my life. I knew the junk in his life. And we prayed together. We challenged each other. We encouraged each other. We, we bugged people together, especially the rest of our friends. I mean, it was, it was great. We did all this kind of stuff. I remember that. And I remember being in another season of life where, where I was in, 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 in my first ministry. And I had this guy that I became such a good friend with. His name was Eric. And, and, and Eric and I just did life together. I mean, we challenged each other. We, we, we struggled together. We, we, we did all kinds of things just journeying together. And it was like this deep, meaningful relationship that we had. I remember even recently I've had people in my life that I've been in like small group community with that helped me through things in life. Maybe we're like some of the rocky times of life. And I remember what it meant to have these people. And I can't imagine going through those rocky times of life without that group of friends to walk with me through that and help me through that and to go with that because I didn't have to do it alone. Because why? God didn't design us. God didn't design this Christian journey to be just you and me all by ourselves. He designed it to be done in relationships in what we call Christian church community. So we can look throughout scripture. And tonight, today, I just want to look at a couple of examples of, of, of people that were in meaningful relationships, meaningful spiritual relationships together, and some of the benefits of them. And, and they're kind of common. One of them is Ruth and Naomi, the, these two women. And another one is, is Jonathan and David. And a little bit later, we're going to look at Paul and Barnabas. But I want us just to look at some of these very familiar relationships or very familiar friendships that we find in the Bible and understand maybe just a little bit of nugget of wisdom out of those relationships that we can apply to our lives today. So I want you to grab your Bible, or maybe the Bible in the seat back in front of you, and I want you to go into the Old Testament. I want you to find the small book called Ruth. It's right towards the beginning of the Bible. You've got Joshua and Judges and then Ruth. Then you've got First and Second Samuel. So Ruth is just about four chapters long. It's pretty short, so you'll, you'll try to find it there. But Ruth chapter one, while you're flipping and while you're looking there, let me just give you a little bit of background of the backstory of what has happened here and, and the setting of where this, these, this friendship is formed. Now, Naomi 
Naomi and her husband lived in the region of Judah, but because of what was going on in Judah and kind of out of necessity to survive because of famine and shortage of food, they decided to move to a region called Moab. So we have Naomi and her husband, and they had two sons. So this family packs up one day. They load up their U-Haul. They head down the highway, and they head to Moab. And they move to Moab, and they begin life. you got Naomi, her husband, and her two sons. Now, the scriptures don't tell us exactly what the time frame of this was, but after they went to Moab and after they settled into life there, the husband of Naomi dies. So it leaves Naomi as a widow. Here she is as a widow and, and, and raising these two sons on her own now. Now, as these two sons grow up and get to the age, they found wives themselves. They found two mobile women. One was the name of Orpha and one was the name of Ruth. And so now this family unit is, is Naomi as the mother of this family. And you have these two sons and now their two wives, Orpha and Ruth, and they're doing life together. And they're doing, who knows what they're doing. They're having like family meals, you know. They're having Thanksgiving dinner together. I don't know. And they're having life together. They, they do all kinds of things together. And in this, relationships are being formed. And, and in this, this relationship between Naomi and her daughter-in-laws are being formed. And there's this great relationship between these girls and their mother-in-law. Now, I'm telling you, some of you may not have. I have a great relationship with my mother-in-law. I have the, one of the greatest mother-in-laws in the world. Unfortunately, she is sick today and not able to hear me brag on that. So, um, but, uh, but I, I have a great, great relationship with her. And here's this great relationship that they have here. Now, 10 years after their marriage has happened, these two sons, the scriptures don't tell us how, but these two sons pass away. If you're to read Ruth chapter 1, the first beginning of it, these two sons die. So now what it leaves this family unit is Naomi and her two daughter-in-laws of Orpha and Ruth. And that's where we pick up in Ruth chapter 1. Look at verse 6. It says, Then she arose with her daughters-in-law, that she might return from the land of Moab. For she had heard in the land of Moab that the Lord had visited his people in giving them food. So she departed from the place where she was and her two daughters-in-law with her. And they went on the way to return to the land of Judah. And Naomi said to her two daughters-in-law, Go, return each of you to her mother's house. May the Lord deal kindly with you as you have dealt with the dead and with me. May the Lord grant that you may find rest each in the house of her husband. Then she kissed them and they lifted up their voices and wept. Let's just pause here for a second. Here's what happened. Basically, this mother-in-law, Naomi, has gone to her two daughters-in-law and said, we've got to go back. I've got to go back to the land of Judah. Uh, there, there's, I, I can't survive here anymore. We've got to go find where there's food. I'm going to go back to the land of Judah. I'm just going to go, go back home. And here's what I want you to do. I want you to go back home. You have honored me. She was there to say, you have honored me and the dead. In other words, you've honored me and you've honored your husbands, my sons, in their death. You've done all you need to do. There's nothing else required of you. Why don't you go back home? Go back to your mother's home. Go back to your father's home. Let them take care of you. Then she even says, and then one day you will be in the home of your husband. In other words, I'm blessing you. Go and, and go back home. Go back home and live life. Be taken care of. And it's okay. Marry somebody else. Else. Get another husband. Enjoy life. You still have a lot of life ahead of you. See this relationship here that Naomi cares so much about her daughters-in-law. She cares so much about Orpha and Ruth that she's blessing them and saying, it's okay. Go be taken care of. Go and live life. Don't, don't shut down life there. And it says that she kissed them goodbye and they lifted up their voices and wept. Now look at verse 10. And they said to her, no, we will surely return with you to your people. But Naomi said, return, my daughters. Why should you go with me? Have I yet sons in my womb that they may be your husbands? Return, my daughters. Go, for I am too old to have a husband. If I said I have hope, if I should even have a husband tonight and also bear sons, would you therefore wait until they were grown? Would you therefore refrain from marrying? No, my daughters, for it is harder for me than for you, for the hand of the Lord has gone forth against me. We'll pause here again, because here's what she's saying to them. They're saying, no, we're going to come back with you. And she says, you're going to come back with me. Why would you come back with me? I, I, can't, I can't give you, I, I, I'm not pregnant right now. I'm not expecting another son. Matter of fact, there's really no hope for me getting married again. There's no hope for me having a son. But even if there was a hope that I was to get married, even tonight, and all of a sudden have a child and be, be ready to have a son now, all of a and would you wait for them to get old enough to marry them? See, culturally at that time, what would happen often, if, if, a, if a brother 
had a brother who, who, who he died, this other brother would take on his wife to take care of him. So this is very culturally what they were understanding there. She says, I don't have any more sons. And let's be realistic. If I were to even have a son and get ready to have a son now, would you wait till they were old enough to marry to wait for them? No, you wouldn't. She said, so just, it, 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 just go. I'm blessing you. Go. Now look on in verse 14. And they lifted up their voices and wept again. And Orpha kissed her mother-in-law, but Ruth clung to her. Orpha finally got to this point and said, okay, all right. And it says she kissed her out of love and out of sorrow in the tears. She kissed her and she made her way back home. But it says Ruth clung to her. I love that word there because it's like this. I can picture this. I can picture in all the sorrow, her just kind of holding on to her or holding on to her arm and holding her close and saying, no, I'm not leaving. No, you're not leaving me. I am in this with you. We are together. There's obviously this relationship between Ruth and Naomi that is just unbreakable. I don't know what it was. Maybe it was those mornings that they sat on the back porch and had coffee together. Maybe it was those shopping trips they went on together. Maybe it was the family meals that they cooked in the kitchen together. I don't know, but something formed this unbelievable bond between Ruth and Naomi. That Naomi, when she said, I want you to go, Ruth clung to her and said, no, I will not leave you. Now look what Ruth says here. Then she said, behold, this is Naomi speaking. Behold, your sister-in-law has gone back to her people and her gods. Return after your sister-in-law. But Ruth said, do not urge me to leave you or to turn back from following you. For where you go, I will go. Where you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people and your God, my God. Where you die, I will die. And there I will be buried. Thus may the Lord do to me and worse, if anything, but death parts you and me. When she saw that she was determined to go with her, she said no more to her. In other words, she's there at the end. It says, Naomi realized, all right, I'm not getting rid of Ruth. There's too much. She, we are in this. I am in this with her. I see how committed she is to me. And it says no longer. And it says that they went on and they lived life together. Now, there's some incredible things there in those last section of verses that I want to focus on just for a few minutes. And here's what I see in this relationship between Ruth and Naomi. I see this unbelievable loyalty with each other. Because what Ruth says to Naomi is this, where you go, I will go. You go, I go. As you go, I go. I am loyal to you. Uh, there's this loyalty between I'm here for you and you're here for me. And there's this unbelievable loyalty that's in this relationship with them. But then not only he says, where you go, I will go. He says, where you lodge, I will lodge. There is this forever bonded, just like, hey, forever we are going to do life together. Hey, where you lodge, where you live life, I'm going to live life. Well, where, where you're doing life or whatever you're doing in life, I'm going to be right there with you. I'm in this friendship. I'm in this relationship with you. All of a sudden, here we are together. But then not only that, she says this, and your God will be my God. I will worship with you. Because remember, culturally where, where um, Ruth would have come from would not have been the worship of the God of this Bible, the God of this, of this universe, the creator of our world, the one and only true God. Her, her culture would have worshipped some false gods, but she says, hey, you've impacted me, so together I'm going to follow with you after your God, and your God's going to be my God. In other words, together we're going to be in this thing spiritually. We're going to worship together. We're going to grow in our relationship with God together. And then she has this faithful commitment. I mean, this faithful commitment statement that she makes to her because she says, where you die, I will die, and there I will be buried. And she said this, thus may the Lord do it with me worse, if anything but death parts you and me. I'm in this friendship. I'm in this relationship to the very end. And let nothing but death be the thing that ends this relationship. This is this faithful faithful commitment. Now, if we begin to look at those things and translate those to us today, what would Coastal Life Church be like? What would the relationships be like in this church? What would your relationships be like if there was that amount of loyalty with each other? Well, what if in this community there were people that had that kind of loyalty that says, where you go, I'll go. There's this loyalty to each other because of the spiritual relationship that we have together. What would Coastal Life Church, what would your relationships be like if we said, you know, hey, we're committed to just doing life together. 
Hey, where you lodge, I lodge. Now, that doesn't mean I want you to come living at my house, okay? Just so you know. <laughs> but what it says is, is when I, where, the way I do life and where I do life, you do life. Let's just do life together. What would relationships be? What would the, the strength and the health of our church be if there were relationships like this that he says, you know what, hey, we're just committed forever to be bonded and doing life together. What if relationships were based on this and says, hey, I'm going to worship you, God, my God, and we are together going to worship God together. Together, we're going to be in this spiritual relationship that we are worshiping God together in our relationship. We're going to grow with each other. We're going to challenge each other. Our conversations are going to be about the things of the scriptures. Our conversations are going to be about the things of God, and we're going to challenge each other in our, in our following of God because there is this worship relationship that you and I have. What would relationships be like and what would Coastal Life Church be like if there was this faithful commitment to the very end to say, hey, I'm in this for the long haul. Till death ends us. I am in this with you to the long haul. There's this faithful commitment that I have in this relationship with you. What would it be like in the life of our church? What would it be like in your life if you had those kinds of relationships? Those kinds of loyalties, those kinds of commitments, those kinds of, of bonding together in life, those kinds of, of worshiping together, the way Ruth and Naomi. Uh, another, another set of friendships that is so great that we see in the Bible is a very common one, very popular one that's looked at so many times, is Jonathan and David. I want you to turn to 1 Samuel. It's actually the very next book of the Bible after Ruth there. So turn to 1 Samuel. And I want you to go all the way to chapter 18. Chapter 18, 19, and 20. We obviously are not going to look at all three of those chapters today. But those three chapters give us the story and a great story of this relationship that is formed between Jonathan and David. Now, let me give you some backstory of this one. Jonathan is the son of a guy named Saul. Saul is the king of Israel. Now, Saul is the king of Israel, and Jonathan is his son. So that means that Jonathan is the second in line to be the next king of Israel. The problem was Saul had become so disobedient to the leading of God and so not honoring God with his leadership, so not honoring God with his life, is that God had chosen somebody else to be the next king. In other words, the kingdom was being taken away from the family of Saul. Saul is currently the king. Jonathan is his son, ready to be the next king, but God has chosen another king. And that was a, a young man by the name of David. And there's this incredible thing that happens between Jonathan and David. Because in chapter 17 of 1 Samuel, what we see is a young shepherd boy named David coming to the battlefields to bring supplies to his brothers. Now, his brothers and all the other warriors were hiding in fear from a Philistine warrior called Goliath. And David, you probably heard the story, at least some parts of it. You've heard that David comes out there and in his, in his courage, in his strength in God, not in his courage in himself, but his courage and his strength in God, he goes out and defeats Goliath. In his defeat of Goliath, all of a sudden King Saul, as any good leader, be like, man, I want that guy on our side. Come here, you know. And so he brings David into his home. And he brings David into his palace. And he says, you will never leave here again. And I, I need you as my leader. I need you as one of my, my, my servants. I need you as one of my warriors right here. And all of a sudden, right after this battle with David and Goliath, David comes into the, to the home of, of the palace of King Saul. And King Saul introduces him to his son, Jonathan. And almost immediately, Immediately, there is this connection. There is this connection between Jonathan and David. And have you ever had that with somebody? Like you meet somebody and like very early on in meeting them, you're like, hey, we're going to be friends. You know, I can tell. I can tell. We're, we're, we're you and me. We're going to be friends. You know, and that's almost kind of what this was. Is there was this immediate connection between Jonathan and David. Look at it in 1 Samuel chapter 18. Look in verse 1. It says, now it came about when he had finished speaking to Saul that the soul of Jonathan was knit to the soul of David. And Jonathan loved him as himself. Saul took him that day and did not let him return to his father's house. Then Jonathan made a covenant with David because he loved him as himself. So let's just pause there because really what we're seeing here is this immediate connection. The scriptures say this. There was this immediate connection, this immediate friendship that was built here. It says that the soul of Jonathan was knit to the soul of David. In other words, man, there is this strong friendship. It's like, hey, there's strong. Hey, you got to remember like when you were little kids, you do like blood brothers. Like, you know, you slash your finger. Come on, man. Blood brothers. We're in this forever. 
You know, it's like this, it's like this strong connection. It says their, their souls are knit together. There's this strong relationship there between them. Look at verse four, because Jonathan, who remember, is next to be the king of Israel. He, he rightfully is royalty. Look at verse four. Jonathan stripped himself of the robe that was on him and gave it to David with his armor, including his sword and his bow and his belt. So David went out wherever Saul sent him and prospered. And Saul set him over all the men of war. And it was pleasing in the sight of all the people and also in the sight of Saul's servants. Here we see this unbelievable just sacrifice that, that, that Jonathan makes. He rightfully has the royal robe on. He rightfully has the armor of the king in waiting. He rightfully has the sword that, that only a, a, the son of a king would have. And all of a sudden he says, what does he do with that royal robe? He takes it off. That's rightfully his and says, I'm giving it to David. He takes his armor and the sword of a, of a royal family and he gives it all to David. It was all rightfully his. But he says, I'm going to sacrifice because there's something about this guy. Uh, I'm in this deep friendship with him. Scripture says that he loved him as himself. So much that he was willing to sacrifice and take the royal robe off and put it on his friend. Now, kind of the Cliff Notes version of, of the story and relationship of Jonathan and David is, is that as, as, as David went out and as the king and as the, uh, not the king, but the leader of all the men of war as commissioned by King Saul, he prospers and God blesses him and he wins all these battles and he defeats all these armies of the Philistines and he does all these great things. And every time he would come back into the city after winning a battle, the entire city would throw this parade and they would begin to cry out, Saul killed his thousands, but David killed tens of thousands. Now you can imagine what any good king would do, right? He's a little jealous of that. Wait a second. It's like, it's like you're, give, you're giving me an applause when I come in, but when David comes in, you give him a standing ovation. Man, man, you're giving me credit for thousands, but you're giving, you're giving David credits for tens of thousands. So Saul gets a little jealous. Saul gets this anger, this jealousy, and this anger begins to rage up inside of him to the point if you were reading all three of these chapters, there's this one day that David just minding his own business. He's in the palace. He's playing his harp. The scriptures literally say he's sitting there playing a harp, and he's playing his harp the way he used to out in the fields watching the sheep. And all of a sudden, Saul is just on the other side of the room, and he's just looking at him, and in there's this internal struggle that he's just getting mad. Maybe he's visualizing those times when everybody was praising David more than they were praising Saul. Saul got to the point he got so mad he looked over and there was a spear sitting beside him. He picked up the spear and threw it across the room at David. Now, fortunately for David, he had like cat-like reflexes, you know, you know, moving out of the way. The spear goes into the wall. David runs out of the room. Jonathan comes to, 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 to David and begins to talk to him, and, and he sees this anger that's between his dad and, and between his friend David. And look at chapter 19. Look at chapter 19 and verse 1, because Jonathan gets to a point that eventually he has to protect his friend David. Look at chapter 19 and verse 1. It says, Now Saul told Jonathan, dad talking to son, and all of his servants to put David to death. But Jonathan, Saul's son, greatly delighted in David. So Jonathan told David, saying, Saul, my father, is seeking to put you to death. Now, therefore, please be on guard in the morning and stay in a secret place and hide yourself. I will go out and stand beside my father in the field where you are, and I will speak with my father about you. If I find out anything, then I will tell you. Then Jonathan spoke well of David to Saul, his father, and said to him, Do not let the king sin against the servant David, since he has not sinned against you. And since his deeds have been very beneficial to you, for he took his life in his hands and struck the Philistine. And the Lord brought about a great deliverance for all of Israel. You saw it and rejoiced. Why then will you sin against innocent blood by putting David to death without a cause? Saul listened to the voice of Jonathan and Saul vowed, as the Lord lives, he shall not be put to death. Then Jonathan called David and Jonathan told him all these words. And Jonathan brought David to Saul and he was in the presence as formerly. He brought him back into the home. In other words, Jonathan went to his dad and said, Dad, why, why, 
you saw he, David put his life on the line when he went to fight Goliath. And you see how he's led Israel to all of this freedom. You've even rejoiced. You've even been happy for it. So now all of a sudden, why are you trying to put David to death? Why are you trying to have him killed? He's not done anything against you. In other words, what Jonathan did here in his relationship and in his friendship with David, he's like, David, I got your back. I got your back, man. I'm willing to even go against my own flesh and blood of my father because of our relationship and our friendship. I think my, my dad is treating you unfairly. And so I'm going to call my dad out on it. And I'm willing to stand up for you. What if relationships in Christian community were like that? Where you're like, man, I've got your back. If I hear somebody criticizing you, if I hear somebody trying to hurt you, if I hear someone trying to tear you down, I've got your back. Why? Because we're in friendship together. Because we're in spiritual relationship together. We're in community together. And because of that, I'm not going to let anybody try to tear you down or attack you. That's what Jonathan did. He went to bat for his friend David. Now, unfortunately for, for David, Saul lets him back in, but then Saul gets angry again and lets his jealousy and all this rage come up in him to the point that one day he is standing there and Jonathan is trying to defend his friend David again. He's saying to his dad, he's defending his dad. His dad gets so angry and so raged as he picks up a spear and he throws it at his son Jonathan. Now, I'm beginning to think this. If I'm in that house, I'm making sure there's no spears next to King Saul, okay? <laughs> Nothing close to King Saul to throw at me, okay? But this day he says he throws it, he misses his own son, Jonathan, hits the wall. Jonathan and David have this conversation again. And Jonathan says, hey, I'm going to protect you. I'm here to protect you. I'm committed to you. He says, I'm going to talk to my dad one more time. And if his rage and anger doesn't think, I'm going to give you a signal. He says, I want you to go way down the field. And if you read the story, you would hear and see all the details. I want you to way on the field. And if I talk to my, my, my father and I calm him down, I'm going to shoot an arrow in front of you. That means you can come back. But, but, but if my dad's anger and rage is so vengeful and it's danger for you, I'm going to shoot that arrow past you. And that means you need to go and flee for your life. Well, that arrow flies past David. Him and Jonathan have one final goodbye. And it says that in their friendship, it says they weep over each other. And they know that it's the best that they have to separate for, for, for David. Jonathan was willing to sacrifice that. Jonathan had this sense of commitment. Man, I'm committed to you. What if you found those kinds of relationships in your church community right here? What if you found those kinds of relationships that were loyal to you, that you knew had your back, that you knew would go to bat for you, that you knew were committed to you? What would your life be like? What would the life of this church be like if those were the kind of relationships that were evidenced here in our church? You see, it's amazing for us to think about when I think about what happens when meaningful relationships take place. I think that community is the incubator for discipleship. I think when meaningful relationships happen, it's like the incubator for discipleship and growth to take place, for the growth in people's lives. I can tell you, when I've been in those kind of meaningful relationships with people, it's been some of the most growing, spiritually deep times in my life. It's those times when, when, when we're in those kind of relationships and we're in that kind of community that we can be in relationships with other people where we can be the real us. We can be honest about ourselves. We can embrace the brokenness in our own lives. We can be transparent and authentic. Now, now I'm talking about where, where people see the real you. They see the good things about you and they see the struggles about you. They see the things that are a little bit messy in your life. It's the, it's the you that you don't have to put up any facades in front of those people. You don't have to put up any mask in front of those people. They say, hey, this is the real me. This is who I am. You know all of me. You, you know all the things about me. I can be real. I can be honest. I can be transparent. And I can embrace my brokenness, not to stay in my brokenness, but so that you can help me grow out of my brokenness. Now, I don't expect that to be like these kind of people, like all 400 people that may be here this week, and you stand up front and say, okay, here's all of my laundry. You know, here it is. You know, I don't think any of you want that, and I don't think any of us want that. But I do think that there should be one or two, maybe the other man in your life, maybe the other woman in your life, Maybe that other couple in your life. Maybe that, that group of friends in your life that you're able to be real, authentic, honest, and transparent with. 
want you to look at one final verse. Ecclesiastes. Ecclesiastes, still in the Old Testament, after the book of Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes. Ecclesiastes chapter 4, book of Ecclesiastes is written for us by the uh, Solomon, said to be one of the wisest men of his time and of all time. Ecclesiastes chapter 4, verses 9 through 12, this is what Solomon says. Ecclesiastes chapter 4, verse 9, two are better than one because they have a good return for their labor. For if either of them falls, the one will lift up his companion. But woe to the one who falls when there is not another to lift him up. Furthermore, if two lie down together, they keep warm. But how can one be warm alone? And if one can overpower him who is alone, two can resist him. A cord of three strands is not quickly broken. So what he's talking about here is relationships, friendships. That two are better than one. Two people can get more accomplished than than one by themselves. We together, you together in relationships can serve God more and get more accomplished for the kingdom of God when you do it together in relationship with somebody else. He says, how strong is the man who gets knocked down but has a companion or a friend to pick him up? But woe is the one who gets knocked down and has no one to pick him up. When you're going through that struggle in life, when you're facing those sins, when you're facing those temptations, when you're facing those discouragements, when you're going through that valley, woe to you that doesn't have community with someone to put their arms around you and pick you up and say, lean on me during this time. It says a strand, a cord of three strands braided together is so strong. The relationships that we have, the relationships that we have that bring this common ground in us because of a relationship that we each have individually with God through Jesus Christ. So here's my question that I want you to ask yourself today. Are you, are you in a meaningful spiritual relationship with someone? Are you in a meaning spiritual relationship with that other guy, that other woman, that other couple, that group of friends? Do you have a meaningful spiritual relationship that's helping you walk through this Christian journey? And some of you may say, no, I don't. I've been wanting for it. I've been asking for God for it. How about asking, instead of asking God for it, how about you step out and you be that for somebody else? Because when you step out to be that for somebody else, guess what? You in turn will find and get those kinds of relationships. I'm going to ask you to close your eyes for a second because I want you individually to think about that question that I asked every single one of us. And sometimes when we close our eyes, we set aside distractions that may be going on around us and we think about what's in our heart and mind. My question to you is this. Are you in a spiritual, meaningful relationship with someone? If you're not, I challenge you to seek it out. What would your life be like if you had these kinds of relationships? What would the life and the strength and the health of our church family here if we were all connected in those kinds of relationships together? Be challenged with that. Maybe today there's someone here that needs to focus on another relationship. It's a relationship that brings us together as family. It's that relationship with God through Jesus Christ. Maybe you're here today and you personally have never accepted a relationship with Jesus Christ. You've never entered onto this journey we call Christianity. Maybe because you thought being a Christian meant going to church or or doing good things or giving things away or, or just making sure you were more good than you were bad. No. Being in a relationship with God, being on the Christian journey simply starts when you realize that you are a sinner and that your sin needed to be punished. Jesus Christ himself came to this earth, died on a cross, was put in a tomb and raised again. And all of that took place to pay the punishment of your personal sins. Then he puts the ball in your court and he says, it's a gift that's offered to you. If you would simply believe and accept 
that I died for your sins and I needed to die for your sins. And you accept that and you believe that and you put your faith and your trust in that and that alone. It says you were entered into a relationship with God Almighty. Eternity in heaven. So maybe for you, that's the relationship you need to start today. You can do that simply in your heart and your mind. It's not about words, but you could pray this prayer. You could say, dear God, I want a relationship with you. I realize that my sin keeps me from being in a relationship with you. I acknowledge my sin before you today. I believe and accept that Jesus Christ died and rose again for my sins personally. So I ask you to forgive me my sins. And today I accept you as my Savior. 